we're not going to win overnight. Yeah, we're going to win. And, I, and I've talked about this for a while that this is the famous quote, you know, um, from Mandela that he actually didn't say, but someone attributed to him that, you know, first they ignore you. So from 2009 to 15, they ignored us, right? Bunch of nerds and geeks with your magic internet money. Yeah, knock yourself out. Then they laugh at you. So 16 to 21, they're like, ha, 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 bunch of nerds and geeks. Yeah, whatever. Then they fight you. 2022, and I think to 2027, which is interestingly right around the time of that bust that I talked about in 2028, I think they're going to fight really, really hard. The cryptocurrency industry found itself under scrutiny earlier this year as the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and other regulators initiated a crackdown, prompting comparisons to Operation Choke Point 2.0. This parallel drew attention to the U.S. government's past efforts, reminiscent of actions taken against industries like tobacco during the Obama administration. Credible sources, including a white paper from law firm Cooper & Kirk, allege a covert financial war by federal agencies like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency against the cryptocurrency sector. Having previously sued these agencies over the original Operation Choke Point, Cooper and Kirk claim that federal regulators are utilizing similar regulatory tools and pressure tactics to debank crypto-related firms. Despite this issue surfacing in March, it continues to dominate discussions eight months later. Recently, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice announced heightened sanctions against crypto-related firms. First, the commission filed a lawsuit against crypto exchange Kraken for operating an unregistered securities exchange and commingling customer funds. Subsequently, the Department of Justice imposed a record-breaking fine of over $4 billion on crypto exchange Binance, with its founder agreeing to a $50 million fine and stepping down as CEO while pleading guilty to charges including money laundering and unlicensed money transmitting. Prosecutors are seeking an 18-month prison sentence for the founder and Binance has accepted the appointment of a government monitor to oversee its operations, with strict restrictions on the founder's involvement for three years after the appointment. Renowned hedge fund manager Mark Yusko, in a recent interview with Thinking Crypto, shared his perspective that Choke.2.0 is in its early stages. Clips from this insightful conversation shed light on the ongoing efforts to suppress the cryptocurrency industry and the potential implications for its future growth. Ms. Warren has a very evil agenda financed by, you know, big financial services company. So uh, I hope anything she's part of gets defeated. And I think we have some good leadership like Senator Lummis and others that that are fighting against that that evil. Um, I hope for, for stalemate, actually, right? I mean, the problem with the legislation that's being proposed right now, it's crazy stuff. Like, like literally, you know, making self-custody you know, illegal. I mean, it, that hasn't made way into a bill yet, but people are talking about it. And there's there's things that they could do that would make it really tough for the technology innovation to really shine. But that's not new. That's mm -hmm. what every incumbent tries to do through lobbying. Mm -hmm. Lobbying is just a fancy form, you know, fancy word for corruption. Yeah. And <laughs> You know, we we talk about all the corruption in all the other countries. I'm like, well, what about all the lobbying, right? It, it, it's literally corruption. You're buying influence. You're buying events. I, I talk about way back when my family was involved in cable TV and um, my dad, along with all the other small cable operators, uh, suddenly faced regulation uh, called the Cable the the Re-Regulation Act, which mm. basically said they all had to become addressable meaning they had to make the cable boxes two-directional. Two mm. Huge capital in, you know, and they didn't make enough money to do that, so they all went bankrupt. Literally, they all went bankrupt. Wow. And John Malone came in and swooped them up and bought them for pennies on the dollar, and then magically that bill got repealed. Guess mm. guess how that happened, right? Mm. And he never made them, well, I can later made them addressable, but it's a game that that's hard to win for the little guy, um, but ultimately, the, the good technologies do win. It just takes time. The nice thing about court decisions is they set precedent. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think they, meaning those on the other side, really thought through the scenario of losing. 
Mm. I think they really thought, look, we're in charge, we're going to win, and, and this will be great. Okay, but if you don't win, it's not just the loss, it's the precedent that gets set that future people can point to when you try to block them using the same approach. Yeah. And so it's great for the industry. And I think the losses are much, much bigger than people think in terms of, of that precedent that, that that gets set. And look, I don't think Gary's in for the long term anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's likely a, a sea change coming and he's probably aligned with, with you know, not the people who will get to make those decisions, at least, you know, that's the way I see it. Um, I definitely wouldn't bet against the incumbents right now, mm. other than, and what I mean by that is we're not going to win overnight. I think they're going to fight really, really hard. So, you know, the next few years are not going to be fun in that regard, and we're not going to just win, mm. but we all know the last part of the clause, which is, and then you win. Mm -hmm. So if you're here, I think we've already won. It's just going to take some time and we just got to keep stacking and keep building and keep focused on the future and, and keep having conversations like this to, to keep people energized and, and excited about the space. Yusko's assertion that the current crackdown is orchestrated by the banking establishment is not mere speculation. It draws from historical precedents where existing industries, feeling threatened by new innovations, exerted influence in Washington to stifle emerging sectors. Similar dynamics unfolded in the transition from horse and buggy to the automobile industry, with red flag laws requiring a pedestrian to precede a vehicle, signaling its approach, a regulation only repealed after 31 years in the United Kingdom. The telecommunications industry also faced resistance against innovations like Skype and WhatsApp calls. The traditional banking sector, generating an estimated $7 trillion annually, perceives cryptocurrencies as a threat, and Yusko likens this opposition to earlier instances of resistance in other industries. Yet, history suggests that, as with telecoms and transportation, innovation will inevitably prevail. Returning to Yusko's interview, he delves into more exciting developments, discussing the potential approval of spot Bitcoin and Ethereum exchange-traded funds, and the anticipated impact on crypto asset prices in 2024. Second week of January, ish. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, do they do they push it one more time and go right down to the wire? I think the eyes of March, mm. I think March 15th is the drop dead date. Mm. They either have to deny them or they are deemed effective. And I said, I think there's zero chance when well, you should never say zero, but I think there's zero chance that BlackRock doesn't get approved. And so... Does it happen on the January 15th date or do they wait till the March 15th date? I don't I don't really know. I don't have any insight. But in both cases, it's before the halving. And you put that event in front of the halving. Ooh, fireworks, baby. I mean, look, we went from 10 to 60 in a matter of months when GBTC was buying in the last cycle and Sailor came on and and, um, you know, Elon was talking about maybe you could buy a Tesla with it. And then he changed his mind and we went from 60 down to 30. And then Sailor bought more and then we went back to 69. But that first pump from 10 to 60, to 60 when fair value was only 30, hmm. I mean, that was almost instantaneous. I mean, it was, and it was that same old, same old. Everybody went home for Thanksgiving. They talked about it. People bought some, people bought some more. Sailor came on TV, GBTC started pumping. I think five or six billion dollars went in at a time when that market cap was much lower and the rest is history. So is this one going to be bigger than that? Yeah, but we're starting with a bigger number. So the law of large numbers is hard, right? It's tougher to double a $700 billion asset than wow. it is a $150 billion asset. It just is. The big banks love the fact that the futures ETF allows them to go naked short. Yeah. Right? And that's why we had this tr tremendous bear market. I mean, you go back to almost the exact day of the launch of the futures ETF was the top of the market in 21. Yeah. And look, if, if people can go naked short, they can manipulate the price. It's been happening in gold forever. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can create a paper asset with a futures contract, you have the opportunity to manipulate. So 
I will argue that commodities markets are more manipulated than Bitcoin market. And there are a lot of commodities ETFs. The, the VIX, oh my God, the VIX futures. I mean, that is a license to just rob people of their wealth. But that got approved and it's got billions of dollars in it. So plenty of triple levered ETFs, which are horrible, just the way they even calculate the rebalancing, just robs people of their money. And yet those got approved. So something like a Bitcoin spot ETF or an Ethereum spot ETF, both of which allow you to actually own the physical asset. Hmm. How could you not want that to happen? I, yeah. I you know, and, and the reason is because by approving it, you're acknowledging that it's real. And the big banks don't want us to acknowledge that it's real yet. And Look, we saw the announcement this morning that you know JP Morgan has got this new private chain to help uh asset management companies, you know, eliminate back office infrastructure expense and lower fees. Okay, great. But it's still a private chain. Private chain. And it lacks all the benefits of, you know, all the, the things we want in a decentralized world. And they made a big announcement and they're patting themselves on the back and, and that's all great, but decentralized is better than centralized and a decentralized future is where we are headed, but not without a fight. According to the valuation model favored by Yesco, Bitcoin's current fair value is deemed to be at least $50,000. Anticipating a doubling of this value, Yesco expects Bitcoin to reach $100,000 around June 2024. This bullish projection is attributed to the confluence of the double-edged sword of ETF approval and the halving event. Moving beyond mid-2024, Yusko envisions a period he terms crypto fall, describing the time after summer when significant parabolic moves are anticipated. The renowned hedge fund manager foresees Bitcoin's potential ascent to as high as $150,000 or even $200,000 per coin during this period. What are your thoughts on Yusko's predictions for Bitcoin and his insights into Choke.2.0? Feel free to share your comments and observations in the comments section below. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.